You're listening to 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College in Garden City, New York. I'm Bill McIntyre here with John Gallo, bringing you news stories about Long Island and about Long Islanders. And welcome on this uh, Friday to another edition of this week's Long Island News. Uh, John Gallo and I, Bill McIntyre, we're here to... uh, Actually, we have a great guest. We're happy to introduce our first guest, which is uh, State Senator Kevin Thomas, who represents the 6th District, which covers a large portion of central Nassau County, from West Hempstead to Farmingdale, including Nassau Community College. Senator Thomas was first elected in 2018, becoming the first Indian American in New York history to serve in the State Senate, where he currently serves as chairman of the Consumer Protection Committee. Well, hello, Senator Thomas. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I, we know you're busy. Every, <laughs> that, that goes without saying, but uh, we appreciate taking the time to come and uh, let us know what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it's, it's my honor. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me, Bill and John. No, no, appreciate it. And uh, like any time. Yep, exactly. Like Bill was saying uh, and alluding to that, we know there's a lot going on in Albany. Uh, There's a lot going on on Island and in the world in general. Um, And uh, it's been a long year, to say the least. And we'll get into that in a second. But we did want to start with your thoughts on uh, how to address the unfortunate reality, which is the increasing uh, kind of prevalence of anti-Asian based hate crimes. I saw that you were at a rally this weekend with the county executive, other electeds from the city and from the Long Island delegation. So can we just have your thoughts and what you know can be done to really make an impact on this uh, issue? It, it's really sad uh, what's going on. I said this at the rally as well. Yeah, we are coming together to stop hate, right? And uh, it's unfortunate that we have to do this uh, every year. It's, it's like a different group. Um, and uh, being part of the Asian community. Um, you know, we are here to better our lives and to see that our community, uh, they're getting targeted because of poison, uh, the rhetoric that was used by the previous president that's leading yep. this is just uh, horrifying. Us at, this, in, at the state level, uh, we've been able to increase uh, and even um, make sure there's funding for programs uh, uh, to stop these kind of uh, acts, uh, either through uh, police action or through educational components um, through uh, uh, community outreach. So um, there's a lot that we're trying to do. Okay, okay. And I know there's a, a couple of pieces of legislation uh, that we did want to get your thoughts on, and the one that does uh, kind of address that fact. But I did want to just get your um Further thoughts. I know you saw a quote you had, I think, in City and State recently, where you were saying essentially that there are a lot of similarities to the kind of fallout of the 9-11 era uh, and the, you know, kind of uh, misappropriation or the, again, the scapegoating of of, uh, ethnic minority groups who obviously have nothing to do with it. And that incident, a lot of times like Sikhs and other folks, um, you know, were being targeted just because of the war on terror, as it was called. And now I know I've spoken a lot with Bill, this language, like you said, from the former administration about the China virus and the war on on COVID and all this stuff. Um, So just, yeah, again, like you said, why is that so pivotal, that language, not just the other things, but the language has to change? It's it's poison. You know, uh, the president, the former president started it. And there are many Republicans who keep repeating it. Um, I think... um, (laughs) Grace Meng, uh, uh, Congressman, had uh, spoken out against one of her Republican colleagues who continued that rhetoric in one of the hearings. And that has to stop. That needs to stop because, you know, there are uh, individuals out there that will take that in and act on it. And Mm -hmm. that's why that's what we keep seeing here in New York City and across the nation where they act on this poison that's being put into society by um, members of a political party. That yeah. is that's one of the... Uh, educating them, just educating uh, the young, because, yeah. you know, they, they are easily, easily uh, pushed uh, because of uh, what's going on in our country, thinking that, hey, all this is happening because of immigrants. 
and now it's because of Asian immigrants uh, this is happening to us, and that is. Yeah. It's always boggled my mind to, uh, uh, when we when we got to that point where. Uh, you know, the immigrants were the problem. Mm-hmm. And I sit here I sit here and think, oh, this is wonderful. A country of immigrants hates immigrants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I said, that, 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 you know, and when I saw your comparison, you know, the, the, the World Trade Center and mm-hmm. those things that happened, that that seemed kind of organic, you know, uh, organic hate that this uh, these latest ones, we know the focal point. We know where it started. We know that it's a, a concerted effort to almost to get these results. Yep, absolutely. I mean, that's the kind of outrage that the former president wanted, right? He, he knew what he was doing. He likes to dangle the red meat in front of his rally crowds and try to get them all, uh, you know, uh, right up. Held up. And here we are, the consequences. And he's at Mar-a-Lago uh, spending a uh, good time doing uh, what he does. Yeah, no, exactly. And thankfully, you know, he's not, unfortunately, worth uh, speaking about as much uh, now that he's out of office. <laughs> we just uh, spent 10 minutes on him. <laughs> no, I know, right? It seems like it, even when we don't want to somehow. But uh, yeah, to well, that point, we're going to move into other things. Uh, yeah. But but I did want to just say, because I know you did have out there, I believe, S97, which would uh, try to amend the state constitution to include some protections based on age, national origin, and sexual orientation. So do you think policy prescriptions like that will make an impact even in this environment, like we said, with uh, the rhetoric? You know, uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, there's a, a sermon given by Martin Luther King, right, where he talks about how uh, lo- laws cannot uh, change the mind of somebody, but it can change the behavior. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Slowly, we can change their behavior through the regulations uh, that we uh, enact. Okay, so, yep, that that's fair. And uh, just then maybe just you're kind of quick encapsulating thoughts on a governing yourself and uh, having to also do not just legislation, but constituent services for your staff, how that's been, you know, we've spoken to obviously County Executive Curran, uh, Mm -hmm. other elected officials, and, you know, we asked them again, how it's been for them adapting. So just you want to just lay out again, how your staff and how your office has been handling for your constituencies, uh, constituency, rather, um, how the situation, the pandemic. Sure. So my office, you know, uh, deals with a lot of constituent issues. And uh, it was like that uh, uh, throughout uh, my last uh, uh, term in office and this term. But things changed during the pandemic, right? It turned, uh, my office turned more from a let's change policy and law to we need to deal with customer uh, issues like immediately. Um, the the calls that we were getting, we were fielding calls about, uh, uh, you know, unemployment checks. We were fielding calls about uh, power outages after uh, the storm that hit Long Island. That's so we turned into more, more of a customer service line where we were like the contact uh, between the constituent and uh, the Department of Labor or PSEG, you know, we were dealing with a lot of issues, um, uh, you know, lack of food, um, homelessness. It was it was very different from the first year in office in 2019, where, hey, we oppose this kind of uh, legislation or we support it. And it turned into, please, we don't have food. Please, you know, I have neighbors that are, you know, this is the kind of calls that we get. Uh, so they did a really good job. Uh, some of them were working, um, you know, night and day uh, to try and help our constituents. And, you know, we get calls from outside the district as well. And we've been able to feel those calls uh, and take care of them. That's so, great to hear. That's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, I, I have mentioned in the past, you know, that I, I my background is in constituent services. And I know how, how difficult that process is when you have people who have nowhere else to know where to turn. And they can't get in contact with PSEG. And we've talked to Mark Harrington about the, you know, continued saga of PSEG, LIPA, and everything else, and knowing that you can't get in contact with them or the DOL about your claim. Uh, we're going to speak to you about fraud, which I know is obviously in your wheelhouse, uh, being the, the you know chair of that committee uh, in terms of consumer protections. But like you said, uh, for a lot of times, people don't know how to navigate government and these other agencies, but you know they see your public face there. They see the commercials. They see you know uh, you out in the district. So 
it makes sense that, you know, they come to, to the electeds to try to figure out what can they do, you know, just who, who can help me further. So, yeah, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Like, whenever I'm at a meeting, I tell them not to Google how to help themselves. You know, call <laughs> your local elected. <laughs> oh, yeah. Professional uh, Googlers well, you know, and it, 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 it yeah, also seems navigating. as though when, when you're successful at something that, you know, to get calls from outside your constituency, I think. I think that's pretty, that's a good sign. It's it's mostly because of my background as ah. Asian. I'm the only Asian elected on Long Island, the only South Asian. So I have mm-hmm. a lot of individuals he, um, this call me talking about, hey, uh, immigration issues, although, um, you know, federal children deal with it. We yeah. then direct them to our federal representative or their federal representative and and work things out for them. But that's some type of, uh, of, you know, calls that we get. And it's, it's different because my staff, uh, it, I probably the only one on Long Island that deal with like foreign issues, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, right. international yep. issues. Like People, they, they, they are well worsted. in. Certainly, like you said, uh, a lot of folks, when they see your uh, name and face, you know, whether it's uh, green card issues or something like that, you know, they see you represent the community. So I know, you know, they turn to you and it's great to hear when uh, they do speak about that, you know, they can recommend other people because they got uh, some of the help that they needed. So, all right, uh, let's uh, let's segue. Let's remind also our listeners that they are listening to this week's Long Island News. And uh, Bill McIntyre and myself, John Gallo, are here with New York State Senator Kevin Thomas. And you are listening to 90.3 WHBC, the voice of Nassau Community College. So now kind of turning into uh, the governance side and what's happening in the moment, uh, in addition to those constituent issues, the budget. That's obviously always sucking up all the air in any uh, kind of legislative mm-hmm. calendar uh, in terms of this time of the year. But now with everything along with COVID, with the funding challenges that have not been faced in you know, probably anyone's lifetimes, really, who's in Albany, for that matter, maybe you know, short of the, uh, the, the crash uh, around housing in, in 09. Um, you know, do you want to just lay out for our listeners? Cause we know it's arcane and I know most people don't know the terms, you know, one house, two house, you know, resolutions and stuff like that. So can you just kind of give a, a simple explainer of that process and where we're at now and what you see going forward in terms of its impact on Long Island. Sure. So the New York state budget is a different beast, uh, to itself. All mm-hmm. right. Um, you can think of a budget, uh, and then when you think of the New York state budget, it's like, wait, this doesn't, this does not yeah. sound anything like a budget. I mean, most people, when they think of a budget, they think of an Excel sheet. <laughs> They're like, all right, this, this gets X amount of money or that gets X amount of money. Yep. The way this works is in the beginning of the year, uh, the executive, the governor, uh, puts out what he thinks should be the New York state budget. That's called, that's called the executive budget where he details uh, the funding for programs. And one uh, thing about the New York state budget is we also propose new laws uh, through the state budget. All right. So that's why I call it a whole different beast because it's not. Yeah. Uh, so not just debits debit. and credits. Not yeah. Just problems. <laughs> <laughs> so right. the executive introduces theirs. Um, both houses then reviews the executive budget and goes through it line by line, either um, confirming uh, or accepting what the governor said uh, should go through or rejecting it. So both houses uh, introduce their one house version um, where we set out uh, the acceptance of certain program uh, programs getting funding or rejecting it. Um, you know, um, rejecting certain uh, policy um, um, ideas through uh, the budget or accepting them. And uh, then we all go into negotiations um, uh, for the next two weeks uh, until we get a final package uh, that we vote on. And the final package isn't just one bill, it's several different ones. Um, and uh, there is enormous debate. Uh, in 2019, I, I think we debated for like 20 something hours, uh, different parts of the bill. And then finally, we take a vote before midnight uh, yep. which is our deadline. And uh, we get us New York State budget, which is uh, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it is certainly no small feat. And like I said, in any year, it is a complex behemoth of a task uh, for the, you know, legislators and, and everyone, uh, you know, who it impacts to kind of 
um, you know, just, just stay aware of. Uh, and this year, we do know that there is the additional uh, impact of federal stimulus uh, that thankfully has, you know, been uh, determined is going to come to the state into Long Island. I believe it uh, is about what it looks like. 12.5 billion, yeah, coming to New York is what I think has been projected and reported, and about 397 specifically to the county of Nassau, and a similar but I think lesser amount for Suffolk. Um, so uh, the question is, you know, how does that play into uh, this process? And also, uh, I know we're going to have a couple of questions about revenue raisers, which I know is the topic uh, of, of task, you know, trying to figure out how do you get these important services funded uh, mm-hmm. when everyone's kind of in a crunch. So, so the, the federal stimulus money that's coming coming in, it's it's a one shot deal, mm-hmm. right? Uh, to plug our uh, revenue holes um, just for this year, but we have to look outside of this year to raise the revenue uh, for the programs that we care most about. You know, uh, funding for our schools, uh, making sure our social. Um, uh, 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 you know, programs are still working, um, uh, making sure that uh, all like the agencies are operating, uh, making sure our local governments get the aid that they need in order to operate. So there's there's a huge, huge undertaking here. You know, we can't just think of um, the federal stimulus wiping out all the issues that we have. It's just a one shot deal. And we have to think of the future. And Bill, I think, you know, that's what I know you had some interest in, like a lot of folks um, in terms of those revenue raisers for long term strategies. uh, We know there's a lot of discussion and kind of uh, debate around issues like uh, gambling and marijuana. And obviously there was the uh, specific sales tax uh, on digital advertising that you wanted to speak about. So I know, uh, I guess if you want to, Bill, maybe where would you like to start? uh, (laughs) You know, well, I read a, I read a quote and it was from Chris Rock. <laughs> and he said he said of course the government is legalizing marijuana because that's what you do when you're broke and desperate. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to understand the the money coming from marijuana if we do legalize it it's not going to be there instantaneously no. right? It's going to take right. 2 to 3 years you got to set up that yep. agency uh to distribute the licenses you know get these things all the ball rolling uh, but uh you know, yeah. it's going to take some time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, know I mean, it's proved about. effective in so many states. I mean, we've seen, you know, um, there were numbers. And I, re- I remember when we, uh, John, we we interviewed um, Police uh, the county executive, oh, okay, Laura yeah. Curran. And, uh, you know, they had an estimate from the governor that the state was going to probably realize about $300 million in tax money. And we don't really know where he got that number, I, I, you know. <laughs> but everybody was, everything was predicated on what he had said about what we were going to realize from it. Yeah. Um, and, and at the time it wasn't enough money. That that was the simple reason why everyone felt that didn't pass then because it just wasn't enough. It wasn't really going to fix. Um, but no, but that, this is going to have to be coupled with a lot of things, revenue, you know, producers. Yeah. We, we've lost a lot. We've almost lost our whole entertainment industry on Long Island. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was responsible for almost a, I don't know, the, the numbers were pretty big as far as the, the taxes that, you know, that we'd realize from it. Um, so you're right. Marijuana is not going to do it. And it's certainly not going to do it immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, what else do we have in the hopper that we could possibly. We, something that we can realize immediately uh, are the casino licenses okay. uh, that can generate like uh, close to a billion dollars. Uh, uh, just, I mean, the owners will put that up immediately. Uh, that's something that you can realize immediately. Um, Interesting. But, but remember, like we are raising uh, the revenue, uh, not just for um, a city and upstate, but for Long Island. What does Long Island want? Long Island yep. wants, uh, you know, property tax relief. Um, there's going to be a circuit breaker in the budget, which allows for uh, a bit of refund depending on um, your property, uh, your income tax uh, that you uh, you know, the, whatever it is that you, uh, your income uh, comes in. Um, there's going to be a universal uh, pre-K. The New York City has it uh, outside of New York. 
New York City does not. So universal pre-K, full-time pre-K for four-year-olds, that comes into the picture. More money for our schools. Um, you know, there's this uh, notion that Long Island is rich. It's not. Um, and uh, uh, our school districts, although they might be in a wealthy neighborhood, there's a lot of uh, uh, need uh, there. And yeah. uh, that, I have a question for you. Do you do you think I mean, the county executive made the the, the idea that um, and, and most Long Island taxpayers are not so upset about the land. tax. They seem to stay pretty steady. It's the school taxes that, you know, there's a cap on it. There's a two percent cap. But that always seems to be going up. And, and that affects so many people. Um, so I don't know that it's the land tax that they're really angry about. Well, school taxes paid through like the property tax that you kind of pay. It's all in there. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. There, I know my colleague, Senator Brooks, has a plan to um, kind of uh, uh, reform all of this so that uh, homeowners are not uh, paying uh, m- a lot uh, to the schools. Instead, it's the state that comes in and does uh, most of the funding of our school districts. And um, the way we fund our schools is just wrong. Um, you know, putting that burden on our homeowners is is not the way to go. And that needs to change. And uh, Senator Brooks has uh, a good plan on this. Wow. Okay. That, now that's that's news. That's news. I can tell people that that that's becoming the approach. I think they'll be thrilled. Yes. Yeah. So, totally. you know, that'll gain some attraction um, again in the Senate. And, uh, you know, there's certainly, like you said, there are a lot of issues in education in terms of equity, you know, somewhat not the same, but similar to the discussion about marijuana. How do you do it and make it equitable? You know, you don't want to see the money not come into the communities that were most disproportionately impacted by it. And education, like you said, we know, um, and, you know, I've seen you, you know, you had a video where it, talking about the difference between maybe the school district on one side of uh, maybe Garden City versus the school district maybe in, in Hempstead. And, and we know that these these longstanding problems and uh, that they will take time to obviously address. But like you said, policy measures, like you just mentioned, um, also other things. I know Senator Kaplan uh, had sponsored with small business relief that I know you've signed on to and other things, you know, hopefully do make some impact. So Let's now transition. Uh, let's remind listeners again, 90.3 WHBC, right. Bill McIntyre and myself here with New York State Senator Kevin Thomas on uh, the Voice of Nassau Community College. Let's try to switch now to some of those other legislative, uh, again, topics that you're, are your priorities and you see making uh, an impact uh, for Long Islanders uh, in specific and uh, specifically around the area of consumer protections. Um, in, ter- yeah. in terms I'm of loving, I'm loving your right to repair act. Oh, yeah. I am, I am loving that. There's a lot of good stuff in there. There's a lot of good oh, stuff in goodness. there. But, but let's start, though, with that. Um, I know, you know, you were a part of the New York Privacy Act in the past, uh, and I believe will be a sponsor for it in this uh, session as well. But in terms of the sales tax on digital advertising, that kind of goes to revenue yeah. raising as well. Why do you think that that's such a good idea? So it's this was. Uh, you know, so before I got into politics, I was a legal services attorney, uh, representing people in the Bronx uh, when they get sued over private student loans, etc. Right. So yeah. when I uh, became chair, I wanted to figure out like how do I help people uh, that have student loans. Um, you know, when you go to uh, Best Buy or to any store, they offer zero uh, percent interest. In, you know, when you finance them, yeah. Uh, our 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 students' future uh, are they not as important as like an electronic product that you buy? <laughs> so I was like, why? <laughs> Can't. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> no, why can't we like offer a similar program um, and have uh, a, a fund for it? And when I looked at all these uh, big companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon, they advertise a lot um, online. And I was thinking, how about we tax that that add as a sales tax and based off of the funds that you get be able to then refinance people's student loans at zero percent interest you know okay, that was yeah. the idea there well you know a promising step i know that the federal government has just uh, they passed a law 
basically saying that people who had their student loans forgiven would not be liable for the tax. Yes, yes. And, uh, and from my viewpoint, I thought, because they, they stepped back, you know, Chuck Schumer is saying he wants 50000 and uh, and Biden is saying he's only going to go for ten. Um, so they're going to argue about that. But the fact that they did this first, to me, is a good omen. Uh, you know, they, they cleared that hurdle before they're tackling the other. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a major issue. So yeah, I know yeah. during uh, the Obama administration, they had pushed forward with policy that said, all right, after you pay for like 10 years, um, you know, your um, uh, student loans, uh, whatever is remaining is forgiven. But that was taxable income. Right, right, right. Uh, forgiveness. Uh, this changed all of that um, mm-hmm. uh, through what uh, Biden pushed forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure many of us are grateful because of that. But I still believe uh, what Bernie Sanders says, which is all student loans. I agree with you, too. And here's here. I got some bad news because this said student loan programs based on income repayment. Yeah. Now, there were millions of people who were. Uh, able to avail themselves of that. You know how many actually had their loans forgiven? Not many. I know 30, 32 people. Yeah, 32 right. people. Now, to me, that was disingenuous lawmaking because those these were for 20 and 25 years, which means that the guys who first put that in place probably aren't senators anymore. They, they may not even be alive. No, no. So <laughs> what, what happened here, Bill, was... Uh, uh, Betsy Davos at the education department, when mm-hmm. you a request like that, they just made it impossible uh, to have those loans forgiven. They would look at uh, uh, what's before them and find some way of saying no. And that's what was going on. And they were sued a number of times, even when um, there was fraud committed by a university that... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. ...to... Uh, they would uh, stand in between uh, the student and forgiveness and say, well, no, we're not forgiving that loan. Uh, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, there were a number of individuals that sued and won, and the courts told um, uh, Betsy Davos to change that policy and forgive those loans. Okay, yeah. yeah. And yeah. like we know that's definitely, uh, you know, that then Secretary uh, DeVos had a very different perspective than Senator Sanders does around these issues and Senator oh, Cooper yeah, and others. Yeah. We Can't know that you're know. out there fighting. Uh, you know, we saw yeah. you have some strong comments on the Long Island Railroad and that whole debacle we spoke to. Uh, I learned a long time ago about that. You like, did. No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all good. You know, they have an app. They look at this app and they'll, they'll, they'll see which car is empty. That doesn't yeah. work in real life. Like, yeah, what they were thinking, but we spoke to uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Long Island Railroad chairman last week, uh, Phil Lang, and he did, you know, tout that app again. And, and, you know, we understand that nothing is perfect, but knowing, you know, how bad of an optic that was, knowing how much for the folks that it did again impact, um, and seeing those social media posts. Yeah. It certainly was something that I, I think they understood they needed to do a good amount of damage control on and, and try to address as soon as possible, which isn't that soon. It's still going to be a little while out, but uh, I know I'm sure you're, yeah. you and others are pushing that to be as quickly as possible restored. Uh, so there's so much more that we need to talk to you yeah, about another day, is. of course. We and gotta, uh, We got to get you to come back. Yeah, yeah we don't want <laughs> yeah. too much of your time uh, further, but um, I just want to just mention, I know some of the other stuff that you are working on, like I said, uh, is a, the, the Patient Medical Debt Protection Act. Um, there's other issues around right to repair and credit fairness acts. And, uh, you know, I know, like Bill had said, that we see those as important things that protect consumers, um, especially around the Privacy Act and the scams. There's a constant influx of people, whether it's a DOL UI fraud scam or whatever it may be, that just don't know what to do and they feel so helpless. So in, enabling uh, policies like that that really give people a, a proper method of recourse, certainly we're interested in the follow-up. And to that point, the same thing uh, with housing discrimination and uh, the fallout from the LI divided yeah. uh, again, you know, finding. So we'll, we'll have to speak about that and some of the other issues with you another time. Uh, I did just want to obviously mention that you do have some events, I believe, coming up uh, that your office is sponsoring, uh, of course. And I think one that I'm interested in specifically is a online kind of forum around water pollution. So can you tell uh, our mm-hmm. listeners and your constituents where they can find out more about that? Sure. I mean, they can obviously contact my office or go to my social media page and you'll have that. But uh, we're going to be having a virtual town hall uh, on clean water 
uh, here on Long Island, March 30th at 6.30 p.m. We'll have a panel of clean water experts and advocates in attendance who can help answer residents' questions. I, I just did one uh, with doctors um, and medical professionals on uh, the COVID vaccines and how they are good. And the, the it, it was supposed to last an hour. It went over that just uh, fielding questions from uh, so many of my constituents. Uh, so uh, we have very informative town halls uh, uh, about issues that matter here on the That's yep. great. And you can um, do it right from you're home. In the, you're in there punching. That's, we love to see I, it. I try. I, I try. Got to gotta make sure uh, our voices are heard. So. It's Mark, a heck of an atmosphere, you know. To uh, We were talking earlier, John, uh, just about, uh, you know, the idea of uh, – Consumer protections have taken a beating over the last four years, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to fight hate in an atmosphere like this during a normal time. It's a tough job. Yep. And, and now it's it's but needed needed. And thank you for uh, being in there punching. Listen, I don't do this alone. I have a, a very, very good team. Uh, in the office, um, you know, that do a lot of punching as well uh, behind the scenes and uh, they do everything that they can uh, to uh, help uh, our constituents in district and constituents outside the district. So yeah, yeah, uh, there we you go. go. Yep, well, so. we thank you for that. And we just have to get you to promise us that you'll come back sometime. Yeah, I promise. <laughs> anytime, if you have something to tell us, we'd love to get in touch with us. And if yep. not, you'll be hearing from us to get you back on and tell us what's going on. Will do. You know, we look forward time. to that conversation you doing, with Senator Thomas. Thank you again so much for your time, and uh, thank you for the work that you're doing on those issues. And I just want to plug to that you are doing a virtual fundraiser with Lyling uh, Cares, I believe, who we're a big fan of uh, around the food insecurity issue. So for more information, they can also find that on uh, your state Senate page. And of course, I'm sure on all the platforms that you're on social media as well. Yes. Thank you so much, Bill and John. Um, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care. Best. Have a great we'll, weekend. We'll Be talk well. to you soon. I, that's uh, you know wow yes we, we hearing what's going on on the ground you know like i said albany is a crazy place uh <laughs> yeah 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 apart uh you know in any good time let alone what's going on you know with uh, the governor and with the rest of the delegations we're on nursing homes around obviously the sexual um misconduct and and worse you know allegations that have been leveled against the governor that yeah, it, is, yeah. it is as messy of a time as i think you know yancey roy or anyone who's been up there all the time would ever say uh there's been so it's interesting to hear his perspective on that. And now... And just a reminder, you're listening to 90.3 WHPC, the radio voice of Nassau Community College in Garden City, New York. This is this week's Long Island News with me, Bill McIntyre, and John Gallo. And we are about to welcome Victor Ocasio, reporter from Newsday. Hello, Victor. How are you? Hey, Bill. John, how are you guys doing? We're doing right. great. Thank Hang you uh, in. for Hang joining us there, Victor. Good to see you again. And uh, yeah. we know you're keeping busy, making sure that you uh, follow that labor beat, which is an yeah. important one. We obviously just spoke to uh, State Senator Kevin Thomas. And, um, you know, we know that there's a lot of tie-in, especially around the uh, the DOL fraud and those types of issues that um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on because mm -hmm. I see that in uh, my kind of work capacity. But mm -hmm. let's uh, just lay it out. I know there were some new numbers uh, in terms of unemployment. And I think it seems like there was a little bit of an unexpected kind of data correction or something like that. So what has your reporting uh, found recently? Yeah, yeah. Well, first off, it's it's good to see you again. I don't think we, we've we talked since earlier in the pandemic, I think was the last time. Yeah, I think maybe your beard's a little bit longer. I yeah. Think a little bit older by a <laughs> yeah. couple of decades. Yeah. Few more gray, few more gray hairs, for sure. <laughs> Amen. Um, well, good so, to see you too, Victor. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, so, yeah, you know, what happens is each year the State Department of Labor goes through a revision, an annual revision. This is common. It happens pretty much every February. What you'll notice is that um, each month we get data for the unemployment rate as well as the number of jobs created or lost. Those are two separate reports. We get them. Uh, once a month for the previous month. So there's always okay. a one month yep. lag. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens in February is we get no reports. And then in the month of March, we 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 get a deluge of reports because they spend uh, the month of Mar uh, February pretty much revising the previous year's data. Because at that okay. point, you have 12 full months, January to December, soup to nuts to look at and, 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 and make those revisions. Mm -hmm. A lot of it comes down to the fact that 
um, throughout the year as they're reporting these figures, they have some data to go off of, but they don't have like the full quarterly payroll type data from employers, which really allows them to dig in there and make sure they've got everything right. Um, some years revisions are fairly significant. You'll go for, you'll go from uh, one of my predecessors, you'll go from a, Oh, that year, it looks like we had a slim gain of jobs, you know, from the previous year. And then after revisions, oh, actually turns out we had a loss, you know, Hmm. that would be a pretty significant revision. By the numbers, the revision we saw this year isn't incredibly significant, but it doesn't really portend great news for the region. And, and, you know, generally speaking, I mean, um, it's been a lot of not great news for the past yeah. 12 years, uh, for 12 months. Sorry. Yeah. It feels like 12 years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but, you know, for example, what we had saw is uh, in the recent unemployment data, the number of employed Long Islanders. So these are individuals. The estimates uh, were revised up. So it looked like initially we had 83,500 uh Long Islanders, um, for one reason or another, uh, lose their employment or, okay. or um, and I'll get to that in a second, what that means. But initially, the revision showed it was actually 10,000 higher than that. So actually 93,500 Long Islanders uh, left the employed column. Um, and it gets a little tricky here because you think, okay, so you left employed. That means you're unemployed. Well, that gets to the definitions of things, which we can talk about in a second. But yeah, that that's the that's the broader basis here is that uh, the number of people who are in the employed column decreased by a greater number than we initially thought. I see. Okay, so that that now makes a little more sense. Um, like you said, giving that a little bit of context. And as you mentioned, a lot of this is kind of not as straightforward as you would expect when you yeah. hear the terms, you know, like you said, on oh, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and what does it mean when you stop working for, uh, stop looking for work rather. And I know, for example, um, what I see a lot is, um, you know, the changes that have come from the federal government, people who wouldn't have qualified for UI traditionally, mm-hmm. people who are like the uh, gig workers, the independent contractors, um, you know, now we see that they are going to continue to get extension mm-hmm. of those benefits. So it, it is important, like you said, who actually qualifies. So yeah. Yeah, and, and and I think the other thing that's important to mention is like, <laughs> so this is one of the things that it's a, makes it a little bit difficult, I think, sometimes to explain. And even me, you know, when I'm speaking to their economists and I'm going over, you know, I'm just making sure I understand. So, mm-hmm. for example, when we talk about unemployment claims, when we talk about people filing for unemployment, yep. that data set, the numbers that they use for that are completely separate from these numbers. So these numbers here, when we say 10,000 more people left the employed column, that doesn't mean necessarily that that data came from, you know, 10 people filing. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. So like, the, the, okay. so like it, 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 sometimes it gets a little confusing because we're using the same words, employed, unemployed, unemployment. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it all uh, seems like we're talking about the same thing. And it all gives us an idea of where we're at. But they do come from separate sources, um, and so sometimes it, it, it's difficult to play around with them. But um, you know, I, the one thing I did want to add to come back to the point about employment. Uh, so when we say ten thousand more people than we initially thought uh, left the employed column, um, when I say they don't necessarily join the unemployed, is because of this sort of uh, it's sort of a little tricky thing here, which is that. If you lose your job okay. and you begin to actively search for work, you are considered under most measures economic to be unemployed. You are without work, actively looking for work. That's the second part. The part. Yep. If, however, you are no longer working but not actively looking, well, then you're not technically anywhere. You're not technically unemployed. That uh, by the definitions they use, because it's somewhat mm. seen as maybe voluntary in a sense. You've taken time in, out of the workforce in some sense. Yeah. Um, the 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 thing though that we'll see, and this is a debate among economists, is okay. When we look at things like unemployment, should we count those people who don't work but aren't actively looking? Because there's a lot of different reasons. So, for example, especially during the pandemic, uh, increased childcare burdens. 
Yep. Who's going to watch the kids? So I leave my job or, you know, I'm not actively looking after I lost my job because who's going to look after my son or daughter? So I'm technically speaking, I would like to work, right? I would love to get back out there. Problem being, these all the responsibilities are keeping me out, but the numbers mm-hmm. don't reflect me. So what actually ends up happening is if I'm someone who leaves the employed column and am not actively looking, I actually just drop out of the labor force. Yeah. Statistically. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So well, we, that's yeah. Important. yeah, it's an important distinction because, and, and there's lots of reasons, health issues, especially now, if someone takes early retirement, we've seen a lot of teachers, for example, yep, definitely. who over health concerns are taking early retirement. Um, those individuals leave the employed column. They don't go to unemployed. Those numbers statistically just leave the labor force, which changes the whole yeah, formula yeah. as to what unemployed, you know, you know, when you hear unemployment rate. Yeah. You know, Vic, it, it just reminds me of, uh, I remember uh, National Community College, actually, when you go to school there, they make you take statistics. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. one of the classes everybody's got to take. Mm-hmm. And this re- always reminded me of that. You know, <laughs> I would be sitting in my car listening to the radio and a guy would say, well, here are the new you know, employment data from the, mm-hmm. and I, I'm wondering when you get that sea of numbers, mm. uh, even before you begin to look, what, what is your like emotional state when this stuff comes in and you say, Oh, here's gospel truth. Uh, here's someone's idea mm-hmm. of what, you know, I'm wondering why we have so many substrata of Mm-hmm. Who does that benefit? Because it mm-hmm. certainly doesn't benefit me when I'm trying to figure <laughs> out, are we doing better or are we doing worse? You know what I'm or saying? Or to the individual claimant just saying, am I eligible or am I not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you, know. No. you know, it's one of these things where we, you know, we work with the tools with, 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 with what we have, right? Of course. And, and so, you know, th- you know, my th- these numbers obviously are reviewed and revised by you know expert economists with the state and obviously there's a great there's a great deal of usability for these numbers in terms of what the state is doing in terms of how the average person can apply these numbers that is a difficult question a lot of times because we are dealing with different measures um all of them however give us one more picture because like for example you know, when I talk about the unemployment rate and we say something like, for example, uh, last year, all of 2020, we had an unemployment rate all told of about 8.5 percent. When I say that, that whether that is good or bad depends on these other substrata type numbers that you mentioned. That's sort of they add the context because uh, we've had a couple of times uh, even last year where we saw the unemployment rate drop in a single month. And that's what you want. You want a low, the lowest yeah, unemployment rate you can get, um, which we had for a while. Prior to the pandemic, we were below yeah. 4%, which is really good, really yeah, good yeah. generally. Um, now, does that mean that a mom of two might be working two jobs and so she's employed and, and uh, underemployed? Quality, <laughs> quality of employment is a different question. No, you're right. Yeah, it's, just a, it's just a binary. Like it's just a binary. But, yeah. you know, uh, we've had instances where the unemployment rate will drop and you think, wonderful, great news. Yeah, everyone you look, at, you the look at the underlying numbers and you realize, wait a minute. It's because a lot of people left the labor force. Yep. So if they left the labor force, my my math here changes the whole formula around. So things can appear more I, positive than they may be. I see. I Which see. is why we need a guy like you <laughs> to tell us what try, the heck try, is going on. Exactly. Well, try. you know, you can only do Parsing your best. I, I, yeah. My heart goes out to you because I see that <laughs> sea of numbers and, you know, nothing gets clearer. No, no, yeah, no. Well, but, uh, yeah. And, and Victor, because you know, what I always say is again that it's you know numbers, but it's also neighbors. That's kind of my yeah. These are these, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, when we're talking about an increase of you know ten thousand more Long Islanders left the employed column from an mm-hmm. economic standpoint, you could look at the total number, the population of people that live on Long Island that work on Long Island, and from a statistic standpoint, you may think okay. Well, this isn't huge. Could have been worse. Could have been worse. But if you're one but, of those people. But if, yeah, if you're one of those 10,000 people that <laughs> lost hard. their job through no fault of your own, and now mm-hmm. maybe you're in an industry that is still largely like entertainment, indoor, uh, 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 leisure, mm-hmm. and, and recreation. If yep. you're in a lot of these other industries, um, 
you may not have a viable work pool to like to, to search within. So, you know, if you're one of these folks, I mean, again, it, a lot of it can feel like numbers on paper and a lot of it is useful. There's no doubt about it, but you know, um, these are individual folks, you know, that we're talking about. These are people whose lives are being turned upside down, um, who's, who are struggling to pay the bills, who are trying to figure out, oh, my God, what's going to happen next month? Um, yeah. yeah. That a psychological yeah. toll of it, it all. A, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, and, uh, and, and let's uh, maybe now try to understand, like you said. I, I, so basically uh, for Long Island, uh, the increase was from about 4% in the year before the pandemic. Yeah. And it's about 8.5% at the end of calendar <laughs> yeah. year 2020. So more yeah, than yeah. double. Um, you know, obviously we saw in between there were some spikes. What was it at its highest, Victor? Was it around like 11 or something like that? Well, or? no, no. Right. <laughs> so uh, back in April, mm-hmm. uh, if, you, if, if you throw your mind back 12 years. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you go, your, <laughs> if you go all the way back to April of last year, this is really when we started to see the impacts of the shutdowns. They didn't yep. really show up in March because, like right. I said, all data is time. a behind. Mm-hmm. So in April, uh, the revised number, uh, <laughs> it originally had been, unfortunately, 16% unemployment oh, yeah. that went up to 17.5% after revisions that we just saw. So, yeah. So at this point, I believe the high water mark is now 17.5% unemployment rate in April, uh, which, of course, is un- unheard of. Yeah, of course, for year over year. So, yeah. okay, that's just for laying out, uh, you know, where we were, where we are, which is yeah. still, you know, plenty of ground that we need to we've regain. Made, yeah, we've regained ground. That is important yes. to, to mention. Well, of yeah. course, of course. But like you said, for everyone who isn't. So that's why I want to understand. Um, and this is something that, again, I do, you know, deal with in, in my uh, kind of, you know, day job in terms of claimants and, and trying to navigate DOL and who gets these benefits. And we know that there's been some policy changes mm-hmm. um, in regards to also the underemployed now qualifying for benefits. Mm-hmm. So can you kind of just give a little recap of, uh, you know, what's going to happen, you know, now that the state and others have realized that this is a problem that they need to have some policy prescriptions do? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, the, uh, you know, obviously one of the big changes that we saw over the past year is, like you mentioned before, uh, gig workers, the self-employed, um, yeah, PUA programs. Yeah, the PUA programs. A lot of people who were never entitled to unemployment benefits as a federal action were were suddenly able to. Uh, which uh, actually, if you look nationally, um, I, I I don't want to speak too much on this, but you know, a huge number of the people receiving any sort of unemployment benefits fall within that category. Self-employed gig workers. I mean, and it makes sense when we consider yeah. the proliferation of things like Fiverr, Uber, yep. Lyft, subcontracting. Um, you, yeah, you name it, there's an app right. for it. Um, and um, so, you know, that's obviously been one change, obviously that we've seen over the past year. Uh, one of the things obviously under the new uh, federal administration under president Biden is obviously, Obviously, the move to extend uh, uh, unemployment benefits as well as uh, enhancements to those benefits um, until fall of this year. So, yeah. you know, currently, uh, you know, unemployment recipients receive an additional three hundred dollars on top of their normal unemployment benefits uh, per week, um, which you know, the, the you know. De- it, it depends on it depends on a lot. It depends on where you live, what kind of job you had before. That three hundred dollars could really make the difference, or that three hundred dollars could really it, it, not it, too it, far it, out. But not. I mean, so it yeah. really depends. No, like you said, if you're yeah. in you know Saratoga, it's different than if you're you know in um, you know Brooklyn or if you're in somewhere. Uh-huh. Yeah, hundred well, percent. Or Long living. Island. Yeah, I mean, of course, be it, right, the cost here. Oh yeah, of course. Oh yeah. No, we certainly talk about that. You know what we said when you have it. All the other things that you're challenging to fight with. You know, whether it be student debt, whether it be mm. you know all the other kind of cost of living aspects that um, don't seem to be declining but uh, mm. steadily increasing. So, so that's important. And, and obviously, you know, there's what happened last year. And then this year, the federal administration did, like you said, uh, and en- enable the extension of the benefit programs, uh, through, I believe, September. Uh, I think the first yeah, week. Yeah. 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 There was, there's a little bit of back and forth because at the very end, if you remember, there's a whole, uh, brief battle over the minimum wage increase, which they were yep. hoping to attach to that, which was the $15 minimum wage increase they were hoping to attach to that. That obviously did not end up happening, and there were some concessions between the Senate um, 
and, and, and the house. And so, uh, you know, ultimately now we're at this point where um, there are still restrictions on benefits, by the way. You know, there's still numbers of days, you know, uh, under normal circumstances, unemployment would exclude gig workers, but it would be like 26 weeks long. Since yeah. then, we've had a series of extensions. The EB program, yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. there's a couple exactly. of other ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. You get it. Yeah, you got, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, a bunch of acronyms. A lot of acronyms. Pretty <laughs> much. And, and there is some confusion right now uh, because, again, certain people don't have to do anything. They just need to continue certifying for the benefits. Other mm-hmm. folks, if they meet a separate standard, basically, if they went back to work, is my understanding, or if they earn 10 times, I believe, what their um, – like kind of base rate was or something along those lines. You have to check DOL puts out pretty clear infographics relatively on, uh, on their social media pages. Not the easiest agency to get in contact with, which oh, <laughs> I'm sure you know, yeah. many, many listeners yeah. out there know firsthand. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, that's a whole other story, but let me get your thoughts too. Um, if um, you've seen in your reporting, anything about the fraud issues that have been happening there um, and, yeah. and what they're doing to kind of, tamp those down. We know it's yeah. not just a New York problem. And we know that, you know, they want to make sure that everyone who needs the benefits gets it. And they don't, you know, restrict it from people who need it. But at the same time, it seems like now there's a bit of a correction of some would argue an overcorrection mm-hmm. where it's, it's kind of tougher to navigate the situation. So what, what have you found? I guess yeah. that way. You know, so yeah, you're right. First and foremost, this is a national problem um, that we're facing. Um, we've seen in other States, I believe it was Kansas, not too long ago had to, shut down their entire unemployment system for like a weekend. They weren't accepting any calls or, or you know, any applications or anything because they wanted to go back and, 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 and try to work through this backlog to, you know, check out what I guess I'd call suspicious claims. You know, you have to determine if something's fraudulent before you. Yeah. They got the UI fraud division. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, in terms of New York, I have definitely heard, I've received calls from readers, um, you know, who have, I mean, I, I think, you know, just as a kind of a mini PSA in some ways is that, you know, there's a lot of different ways this can go down, but generally speaking, what happens is uh, a fraudster, in some cases, criminal rings outside of the U S they uh, end up finding your personal information, social security address, all these kinds of data either. And, and this could be from a data leak that happened years ago at your bank or your, you know, whomever we, we, we've heard about leaks all the time. Um, and they take that information, and then what they'll end up doing is they will file an unemployment claim in your name. Um, and depending on how tricky they are, they may have the correspondence address uh, m- removed to another address entirely. So you never get a letter from right. the Department of Labor or anything. They want to keep you out of the loop as long as they can. Yeah. Uh, some of them don't. And people, the victim, will see there, get a letter from uh, from the Department of Labor, and they're going, wait a minute, I've been gainfully employed. I'm, I'm overworked. Yeah. How are I'm, you telling me I'm fine? You know, <laughs> Why am I getting uh, this key bank car all of a sudden that I never and, set up? Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, but, you know, New York has uh, given all indications that they have been fighting this issue. Um, it is a big issue. We have a lot. We have a huge population. We had a huge number of people on unemployment currently applying for unemployment. So, it, it does bring out the opportunistic, you know, criminals out there, uh, unfortunately. Um, but you know, I, I have heard that generally speaking, which may or may not be cold comfort to to people who are victims of fraud, that New York is working on this issue uh, pretty proactively. Uh, some other states have struggled much, much more so with this. And uh, that said. Uh, to your previous point, it, it, it I have heard from people that it can be difficult to get through to the Department of Labor, mm-hmm. specifically even if you have this fraud issue. So, you know, yeah, that's but, but uh, yeah. I'll just say yeah. from my experience, you know, they do handle the fraud issues a little bit quicker than some of the other longstanding claimant concerns. But yeah. at the same time, there's such a volume. I'll just say personal anecdote. Again, I do this um, in my professional career. It's just people trying to navigate it. But I got a notice. Uh, My mother hasn't worked for 30 plus years. We got the notice in the mail saying, hey, Uh here's your card. We have the claim. Thank you for (laughs) filing. Everything went through. And then later on, we got one saying, hey, sorry, we couldn't set up your direct deposit. Thank you. You know, we we got the attempt that you made, but it didn't go through. Thankfully, they caught that. But it it is certainly I talked to seniors. I talked to other folks, you know, where English isn't their primary language. And they are so lost on what to do. And when they call that number that understandably many, many people are calling. And they get a message yeah. that they don't understand. They don't know how to do it. 
it certainly leaves people, you know, in a really kind of desperate place. So it, it's, you know, good to hear that things are being done. And I did see that they wrote out a new identity verification. Yes, party, correct. Uh, yes, software. correct. Yes, they did do a, 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 a new uh, ID.me sort of, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. They yeah. partnered and contracted to, to sort of have this online verification tool, which – because part of the problem, too, is we've been talking about people who are employed and are victims of, of this fraud. Uh, but there's another aspect of it, and I actually heard the story from an individual uh, who got a letter uh, saying, hey, you know, we, we got your attempt to apply. This person was gainfully employed. They did what they could. They reached out to the state. They thought, all right, I made the effort to reach out. I should be fine. They lost their job the next month. Then they went to apply. Oh. Then their entire process was held up. That's what I see me. a lot. That is really wow. Important. They're yeah. trying to verify who they are, where they worked. That's where this ID uh, me, I think it's ID dot uh-huh. me verification comes in because they're trying to simplify the process. Because the last thing you need is when you're down to be sort of kicked while you're down. Exactly. The yeah. process of doing this. So the state has tried to alleviate that through this measure. But I mean, it's it's t- terrible. And the worst part is. You know, I'm sure that unfortunately there are going to be people in the state who get 1099s. Uh, I believe that's the tax form. Yep. Get 1099s uh, in, in the tax year for income, and they're going to go, "What? I never. I, what are you uh, talking oh, about? Oh yeah, oh no. And I've so seen that's possible. Um, yeah, I've seen people get 1099 Gs. Um, mm. You know, and and then they get the notice to repay for a claim oh, that they never God. filed, and they say, okay, now you're on the hook for $20,000, and as you'd imagine, that, that certainly has yeah. surprised the people who have yeah. no knowledge of any of this happening before, yeah. so that is certainly wow. something that we'll keep monitoring, and I know that it's yeah. good to know that you know, you're apprised and, and, and trying to follow that, yeah. and along with the rest of the data trail, which is certainly endless-seeming. Um, well, but- and just to, to add to that to, for our listening audience is that mm-hmm. we always try to tell them that the IRS will not call you on your telephone, mm. uh, you know, those kind of scams can be avoided very easily if you yeah. just don't get scared. And I mean, look, we don't even answer the phone at home anymore. That's what sales calls and that yeah. kind of junk has yeah. done. It's a beep. Um, yeah. No, well, yeah. They leave a message. If you want to leave a message, great. And yeah. then it's if up to me. It. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's really weird, but they won't call you at home. They, they'll send you a letter, um, you know, and you can start there, but yeah. don't, it, you know, and old folks get they get scared. Uh, I understand. Just for something like you're saying, to be on the hook for twenty thousand dollars, you had no clue yeah. what was going on behind your back. Yeah, you know? exactly. So, yeah. thank you, Victor. Again, I know yep. this yes. is a dense topic. Um, you know, obviously, we look forward to having you on another time. Well, of course, keep, keep us up, updated and apprised. Um, um, I did want to mention that people can follow you, obviously, on Newsday and all your reporting, and at Victor Ocasio. And uh, just if you want to say, maybe in, uh, we got only about a minute or less here. Just yeah, where we gotta- do you think you're going to be? Uh, <laughs> reporting and where do you think again uh people should be focused on in terms of labor numbers uh the employment status and hopefully it's kind of rebounding uh as best possible yeah i mean i i i think there are a lot of uh there's a lot of things to be positive about i i, I know as hard as that is to say i think going forward you know um from my talks with economists there is this belief that as the vaccine be, continues to be rolled out um, as densities of, of, of establishments is increased, um, that there is going to be a return to a better time period. Now, whether that's back to normal, that's up for debate entirely. But the truth of the matter is prior to all this, we were not in the worst state by the numbers. There were still issues for sure. Uh, and that leads a lot of economists to believe that we can get back there we can get this is a once in a lifetime kind of thing so okay so i think it's important to Mm -hmm. not get so mired in the bad that we forget that the economy is is a changing thing yeah thank you okay thank you very much victor we like to thank victor ocasio we'd also like to thank newsday um as as usual for helping us out of course we'll talk to you soon victor i know you'll you'll come back right all right well yeah of course (laughs) i will bill john it was great to talk to you guys same Victor. thank you catch us again next week Yep. I want to thank uh, State Senator Kevin Thomas also for joining us earlier yes. and remind everyone that they can follow us on social media at the News and at PWLI News. Thanks again. And you'll see us same, same time, same place right here on 90.3 WHPC.